Hello everyone, today we talk about the Scandinavian Leidang. So I've checked by the way is the, the right pronunciation. I think it's not properly not nor Leidang or nor Leidang. It's like something like in the middle Leidang, something like that. Uh, I checked some philologists before <laughs> um pronouncing this, but I guess it's not so important. I think the and the actual Norse for it is Leidang or something like that and this was uh, originally made, I think the etymology, but I'm not sure about this is, um, should be, of Leidang should be fleet hmm? um, <coughs> even though it had the character more or less of a general levy that was aimed at in fact, le uh, levying ships hmm? uh, from, and this is an institution, a form of recruitment that seemingly was already into use uh, from the mid 10th century uh, with this term in the Scandinavian countries or also in Denmark actually I think it's my the first uh, evidence of it we have it from, from Denmark proper as being the, the most developed of the uh, northern countries also in here I will I, I will stick to northern countries perhaps because Scandinavian is tricky because it's, it's just Scandinavian, not uh, the Jutland Peninsula. So, so I, I don't want to say Viking either because that's not pro the proper term to address um, these uh, political entities. So we'll just stick to this vague northern country that you know is countries that is probably not the best either, but at least it's not so so improper. Um, <coughs> So this is something, th this is a kind of recruitment that um, even if had developed in the uh, Viking Age. Mm -hmm. So the Viking Age, so the the uh, great um, exp um, maritime expansion of the uh, northern peoples of the Scandinavia uh, and of the Jutland, that even if relied on, on ships for uh, going, you know, for essentially carrying out piracy, expanding, going colonizing new lands and um, on Schwerpunkt, we didn't talk very much on uh, about the Vikings. Telling the truth, I don't know how rightfully, because it's true that there are s so many other things except the Vikings in this period, but I think I, I have to fill some gap in here, uh, as my Viking era playlist is pretty, pretty uh, light <laughs> at this point. So with this one, I'm not even adding it, because today we're going to talk about the Leidang, actually in the... Um, say at, at least from the very end of the Viking uh, age uh, and into uh, essentially the uh, the, fir the the initial the beginning of the feudal age at least in Scandinavia and only in the north uh, once again approximation um, and um, because definitely there were some overlap but I mean the uh, Leidang is something I think it's witnessed still very late in time just yesterday I was reading from a book I don't remember where, where it was in Norway <coughs> or in Denmark that uh, there was a 15th century source who was talking about it um, so it's something that remained definitely as um, a form of um, a system of organization properly rather than strictly recruitment because we will see eventually also how the Leidang uh, evolved over time from uh, an actual commitment of um, certain men that had to go to, to participate to the expeditions into essentially a to transformation into a sort of tax that was extended also on communities that traditionally speaking first of all didn't exist during the Viking Age because we're talking about the church um, that was form was being formed eventually with the spread also of feudalism um, so in a moment of change we're gonna discuss essentially between the 11th and in the 13th century here um, but it's important also to understand how this organization was created back in the past because as we said before the first evidence I think it's in, in mid uh, 10th century Denmark of the Leidang from the Skaldic uh, corpus that we, we have but there are um, we um, uh, at least by that time that's an impression I got because by the way I'm not an expert at all so that's also part of the reason why I don't discuss about Viking history very much. But as far as I've understood, by the mid 10th century, we see from the evidence we have that the Leidang system was essentially pretty much uh, in, um, already pretty much structured already um, and and systema uh, systematically used all over the, the northern countries. And, and there is reason to believe that such system of recruitment actually began very early uh, in time. 
and we could even date it back uh, obviously it might have been called in another way but I think also in here I think that the, the term would remain pretty much the same also if we have no direct evidence of it um, because after all these names are all very simple so in etymology they're pretty also pragmatic uh, uh, terms we can we can say to a certain extent and the um, there is however reason to suspect that such organization existed since several centuries into uh, Scandinavia and in the north of Europe. Um, the so and from very early as much as the beginning of the migration era, actually, if you think about uh, the, the the Saxon invasion of Britain back in the day, um, well, that's something that mm, originated in similar ways, let's say, to uh, the dynamics were occurring. Uh, into the Viking Age. It was th there were these populations coming from the north of Germany, from Scandinavia, that essentially started to come from uh, from there and, and settle into into Britain. And this is something that, by the way, began very early in time. I think there is evidence it's as early as the second century or the third century. I think the second century, even A.D., uh, to which w there was an Anglo-Saxon settlers that crossed the. Um, this is, uh, I mean, Saxons, uh, uh, in generally speaking, crossing the sea and settling in Roman Britain, and actually being settled with the allowance of the local administration. So it was something uh, useful, you know, that and also for the dem demographic reasons, the, the Romans were quite inclusive in their, um, um, you know, immigration policies. That they tended to to bring as many people in, and in order to make them. Uh, work for the empire, make them pay taxes and so on. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. Towards the late Roman Empire, the, the Romans also built a frontier on the eastern coasts of Britain, which was um, called Litus Saxonicum, so literally the Saxon shore. Um, which, by the way, would become, uh, also if you think in later uh, you know, English history, uh, thinking about the uh, uh, the Danelaw, uh, for instance. So it's always this area that since arguably, mm, at least from which these Germanic populations set in motion, was exposed to such phenomena. Mm -hmm. Also the Celts had arrived like that, it's migrating from uh, from a closer ra uh, land, that is Belgium essentially, as basically all the Britons were Belgians in practice, since they came from there also. And that's a process that lasted for many centuries actually, and obviously these populations diver had diversified, etc. But if you see throughout all the migration era, the Viking era, arguably this migration from the from Germany and Scandinavia never never quite actually ceased um, in uh, in Britain. Um, and was normal, therefore, to understand these populations living in between the, the, the North and, and the Baltic Sea to have always had a kind of mm, predilection for for sea adventures. After all, um, in the late Roman Empire, you find also a lot of Frankish piracy, for instance. You find mm, Frankish mm, pirates, I don't know, in the Black Sea, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so when the Franks were still in Germany. So you realize these populations were acquainted with the sea for, for obvious reasons. After all, the same Germans as a, um, you know, the Germanic stock and the, the Germanic Indo-European branch um, kept memory of this um, crossing from Scandinavia, that was considered the uh, original motherland from which all these peoples came into, uh, into the continent. This uh, relation with water actually um, is quite out there into the Nordic uh, world, into the Nordic sagas, and into the the more even more ancient memory of the uh, the early Germanic tribes for mm, for which it was handed down to us. There was a lot of sacrality, seemingly um, related to the same concept of the water. This is something you find into the uh, Frankish. Uh, mythology in the Longobard uh, mythology. Um, so these lands um, across, um, you know, the, the Baltic, especially and, and the North Sea, were always crossed by uh, 
these populations it was an activity that even we can't trace very well but that had definitely a uh, that existed since ancient times if figure about trade that existed uh, from let's say central in central europe it was uh, from from central europe the and the springs let's say of the rhine uh, there was this um trade flow that 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 went down the rhine towards the north uh, sea and then uh went up in latitude uh, along the norwegian coast um and you know this was a, naturally a a um a maritime trade um and uh, therefore this kind of maritime ac naval activity had always been out there uh we wish we knew more about it because even in the the major uh even historical evidence at our disposal i think it's definitely mostly from the from the viking age but uh, we shouldn't cut that so you know mm, in, to this um narrow um temporal limits and that's an activity that uh, you know taking the sea going going by sea was definitely pretty much human and that's what humans have always done everywhere the w there is a sea to uh to sail in um so the we think that the Leidang actually originated as far as I think the sixth century. Mm -hmm. This idea of organizing a levy of ships, men and provisions that um um in seemingly evolved from especially from those areas that were a bit more developed. In fact, probably it originated in to the Utland Peninsula that among the northern countries where that was definitely the um, the most florid and in fact the one into which also the monarchy developed earlier had more a uh, more uh, organizational uh, capabilities um, and that mm, substantially um, committed the coastal communities mm, to provide um, uh, this a certain quota of men and material mm. So there were these coastal districts that were divided up into ship raids mm, uh, responsible for supplying ships and uh, the of, of a um, excuse me predetermined size and number by the way because this could really vary uh, when you think about recruitment in, the, in times like this arguably for the old middle ages and even before um, this recruitment was never something um, let's say um unchanged uh or uh, fixed and movable that was always provided with that regularity or with this that same quantity but it was just an organizational form mm, uh that naturally was based on the political cooperation of all these various communities of 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 tribes of lordships eventually uh that decided to join into these expeditions and then even you know making mass was an or at least putting uh, more resources together would would bring to to high higher profits hopefully um given the nature of these expeditions were essentially aimed at raiding and collecting loot mm. so uh, th what the germans didn't do on land they did uh, they, do, they did it on 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 the sea equally mm. um this was piracy let's be honest about it. It, it could have been extremely well organized sometimes the vikings were able to mount up huge expeditions also of, of tens of thousands it was uh, an amazing fit logistically speaking also given the, the economical potential of northern europe that definitely was uh, not as developed as is in other areas of central and southern europe um, and that was aimed at looting and this mm, you know the today we're not as i said before we're not talking about the viking age proper uh, but we have to be clear about what it practically was. There was naturally a lot of infight also between the same coastal communities. Um, the the same northern monarchies emerged from essentially this um, continuous mm, attempt to extend um, the lordship of a certain uh, chieftain over uh, large areas, lar uh, large communities. Sometimes this lordship was only nominal. It, w it came. It there was a very low degree of centralization in Scandinavia compared uh, to, to to the rest of of um, of the continent. This is why also feudalism and and, and uh, more structured monarchies took 
much more time to develop uh, into the low Middle Ages actually than, than, in, than in other countries where more or less they had already been shaped at least they, they had a stronger base I think I discussed uh, now that I think about it in the Viking era playlist I made a video called characteristics of the northern kingdoms in the low middle ages that deals a little bit in general with this topic with this idea that uh, I mean how these monarchies eventually were formed um, and the the idea was that through these Mm, ma uh, naval expeditions and a successful loot, etc. It was possible essentially to reverse the political balance at home mm, because the local resources were were a very few. Mm. So that's also part of the reason why the Scandinavians took the sea at a certain point. It wasn't just piracy, as we know, it was also colonizing other lands because uh, there was no enough. Uh, um, surplus at a certain point to sustain the world population. This was typical of all, arguably, of, of all the Indo-European peoples back in the day when the economy was quite primitive and in Scandinavia this persisted for, for a longer time. Normally when we have to explain the phenomenon of the Viking expansion we recur to the, the idea of the global warming, so this fact that m more people began, especially more children, began to survive and therefore there were more mouths to, to feed, this was not possible, so the normal thing would be to take your clan uh, and to go settle somewhere else. And this is how it happened, indeed, if you see what happened in Britain, into Ireland, into Greenland, into Northern America, I mean, wherever the Vikings eventually came to, or tried at least to settle. Um, this uh, Iceland, I forgot, <laughs> um, that's also arguably some of the most fascinating chapters of Viking history. Um, the So, this was, um, you can argue that the uh, northern peoples had kind of specialized into this form of organization. After all, we all admire the, um, the novel engineering of the Vikings. Why? You know, why especially them? Because because they had been obliged by environmental factors to develop those abilities to know how to build such ships, how to reach faraway lands, how to maintain contacts, how to, to trade, to, to make war through them um, and that's what made the, the Vikings great um, in the uh, history of achievements of, um, of human mm, technology you know, and, and and seamanship, and def definitely uh, at this point, um, the so the Leidang, as we were saying, by the beginning of the period we're discussing now, was already essentially well developed, well organized. We have um, maybe we will talk about this when I make a video properly on the on the Viking um, era. Uh, I mean, looking at, for instance, at all the coastal um, districts and how much they have to provide and so on. But for now, we will just talk at it in, 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 in general. And this lighting had took shape essentially of a um, of a general levy in many ways because there were other le levies um, that were based essentially on the like in other countries on your juridical condition. I mean also in Scandinavian countries in, in the Jutland was this um, general levy of all um, able-bodied uh, freemen that had to be, because obviously not all these populations lived along the coasts, there were definitely also other districts and even the same coastal populations could be and were often involved into uh, terrestrial fight of course but definitely it was a great uh, deal of emphasis and um, you know the, the, the maritime and naval expeditions were an enterprise mm, were something extremely profitable especially in those uh, conditions that began to take shape with the, col the collapse of the Carolingian Empire um, in, in, in Britain etc. so where this uh, uh, Northmen began to see there was enough to raid and take and, and, and that was like say the quickest way to become rich and that's why <laughs> what you would go for 
Um, excuse me, drink once again. So, the Leiden took, however, in this sense, often the character of a levy, also in here of each uh, able bodied man, mm -hmm. um, which lasted for a time, usually um, of four months, at least this is. Um, uh, this is what you find often read, but we, we have evidence also of shorter times, like two months, for instance, this is um, showed by the um, some uh, by the, the Gulating law. Gulating is uh, um, th this mm, was essentially a, a, an assembly, a general council that was uh, took place in, in Gulen uh the in Norway in the southwestern part of the Sogn og Fjordan county as if I pronounce it correctly which I don't think so <laughs> um uh, so th th it's essentially in the west coast of Norway mm? uh in the north of Bergen and this is an assembly uh, or parliament how you want to call it that took place for for a very long time actually arguably from the the beginning of the 10th century at, uh, at the uh, latest and the um, the 14th century mm -hmm. and this was a very prestigious parliamentary assembly in medieval Norway so it, it was one of the oldest and one of the largest um, and the uh, there is also a lot of local traditions attached to this and and we get uh, obviously uh, also informations from what was emanated from this legislative activity we can and much of, of of these laws actually were aimed like arguably also in the rest of of the continent to um determine the um the uh the conditions of of of, of service of recruitment which was arguably at that point probably the, the the dynamic around which the greatest uh, political, military, and and social um, balances um, um, uh, revolved uh, around, hmm. because this was a huge commitment by these communities. Um, you can think, as we we're saying before, of the sheer res number amount of resources that were invested in such military expeditions. So we'll see; that were actually quite impressive at least on paper, we know that we we'll see now that the numbers uh, of the number of ships and men that were uh, committed to these expeditions, you realize given what was the local potential that these were activities that really um, encompassed the dual spectrum of society mm -hmm. and, and, and and this like, makes you think why Viking raids were so uh, profitable for them, because it was a way to really change a lot of things at home, etc. And this was arguably a process, naturally, also of through which uh, the elites were able to extend their um, authority on the communities. Mm -hmm. um, it happens all the time, arguably, in history that when uh, there is a prolonged warfare, at least, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, directed against ex external enemies or um, or within the same society, however, this time in Scandinavian society was really both uh, at the same time, um, and the, there is an increase of central authority. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very important because before the, the Viking Age, in fact, we don't know substantial mm, monarchies that that I mean monarchies had obviously always existed in in some way since since prehistory conceptually but you know given the 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 monarchies we start seeing to high medieval times definitely also the Viking Age was a factor that brutally accelerated the um, progressive naturally uh, stratification of society and the development of monarchies uh, on the base also on the Frankish model because uh, during here the, the 11th the, the 13th century basically the 
the northern monarchs were were essentially importing the um, the Frankish models, the feudal models. Uh, they were Christianizing. They were uh, creating a slowly transforming their uh, herd um, into essentially a feudal retinues. They were uh, building churches, abbeys, structuring a an ecclesiastical domain. So these were all strategies that brought uh, that had that, that were aimed at structuring a um, um, a hierarchy in society and therefore uh, increasing the power of the say central monarchy it was an extremely slow process especially in Scandinavia mm -hmm. so um, relatively going back to the service because there will be also here something to add we've seen um, these expeditions uh, lasted normally two months four months naturally there were and we know it, uh, certain expeditions that went um, very l longer than that. At a certain point, the um, the Vikings had began... Uh, the initial Viking raids at the beginning of the Viking Age were, were, were short, were quicker. Uh, they lasted less. Then after some time, they, the, the Vikings started, for instance, to, to spend the winter to places like France, etc. So these expeditions were naturally something greater than that and um, it's interesting that recently I discussed about the uh, system of recruitment of the into, into the Carolingian army uh, the Carolingian Empire and in the late Roman Empire um, and you see that there were al th there is always this um, difference between what is the um, the the service do on paper legally speaking, and the practice of warfare. You can argue that um, during the Viking Age, the Scandinavian society underwent this crucial passage that kind of every society goes through, um, that is the transformation from a seasonal warfare into essentially a professional one that lasts more. Mm -hmm. So you... you you don't th these levies like le the laid angles, the the other ones that existed for generally speaking, the, the general levy of the population, were um, issued naturally with um, as a minimum. Mm, it, this came from a, a political bargaining essentially between the central power and the community, or uh, arguably at this time where the same communities were, and the elites were trying to force in the same communities to 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 make this expedition last longer because evidently the average freeman didn't give a damn about these things or, or at least maybe he he did maybe he ventured on his own but he didn't want someone who imposed this form of expedition where he didn't want to and you know that in the northern countries this was a very strong um, um, freeman's um, egalitarian thinking at least compared to to the rest of the continent naturally in Scandinavia, like in any other place, it was always, at all times, the elites who practically uh, governed. Um, but the, the Scandinavian society was the least stratified in this sense. So even the, I don't know, the Scandinavian elite might have been um, sort of gentry compared to to other to other uh, countries, especially this time. Think about how stratified was Frankish society at this point, and the, the Scandinavian one was extremely egalitarian in 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 comparison. Um, so it was very, very difficult to impose these uh, services um, and the general development of these um, levies evidently came from, however, probably the, the greater interest that the whole community had as a whole in going to raid other peoples, given the profits that could be taken from that. But there was always a tension between... We can imagine also a lot of traditionalism involved in the thing because um, uh, the tradition was based on this concept that Freeman had basically all the power. Nobody could tell him what to do. The Viking Age pushed, in this sense, to, to a modernization and to, to a concept that at that time surely sounded very controversial that was venturing into other lands and having other uh, 
other horizons, and, and this naturally transformed local society radically, and not necessarily for the better, especially for the average freeman. This is a process that happened so many times in history, the same, arguably, I don't know, with the Romans during the Second Punic War, you know, going out of Italy, having this... So even the, the geographical dimension here is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, there is always a sort of resistance attached to traditionalism, a reaction to this. And you can look at the Viking Age and said this is a fort, this is a very entrepreneurial and, uh, and bold and audacious... Um, uh, um, aristocrats to kind of expand also the the horizons of the of their own world mm -hmm. and and changing essentially um, the Scandinavian let's say the the Nordman's, uh the Norman society uh, forever. Um, so, what was issued in these levies? Well, f fundamentally, um, there were certain local districts, as we've seen, that were based on either uh, certain land units mostly, so uh, either a farm or a group of smaller farms joined together, or a unit of land assessed at one... Uh, sometimes um, these, these lands, especially in later times, uh, now mm, I repeat we're talking about low medieval, uh, let's say high medieval times between in the 11th and the 13th century, so after the Viking Age was... was the Scandinavian land was also trying, um, beginning to be monetized. You start to find equivalents of land put into money. Mm, so also the currency was spreading. Um, this unit of land uh, that had to pro provide uh, each man and um, the um, relatively uh, relative equipment and provisions was ac assessed at one gold mark. Mm. Also, this naturally could vary a lot. Um, now, this is very interesting because it's the same exact f um, form of recruitment that exists in the rest of Europe. Every single European country at this time had the same form of recruitment based on the number of farms or maybe it's monetary equivalent. This happened with the in the Anglo-Saxon Fiat. Uh, it happened in the Carolingian with the Carolingian Mansi. Um, this exists. It, it was everywhere, literally, and it was pretty much obvious because at this time Europe was pretty homogeneous in mm, political and social, uh, social and economical forms. So it was the the core of the the uh, the property was definitely the land, and every owner was uh, issued to provide a certain amount of of men and material for the the military expeditions. So. Um, Essentially, so we, we see these um, consortia, even of smaller owners, that mm, essentially came together and uh, to provide the um, necessary amount of uh, um, of, of uh, resources requested by the recruitment system, so that everybody had to participate to this expedition. Uh, the the single unit was the, the, the one man, mm. physically, the his equipment. Uh, this was uh, the equipment was segmented, I think, like also in other uh, countries. Like, I mean, there were. Um, uh, I actually have no data on this specifically, but um, there were people who had provide more uh, equipment. Some now in the, in they in they were already uh, issued with uh, with horses, crossbows, mail armor. Mm -hmm. Uh, these were, mm, you know, m m actually mounted combat, mail armor, uh, that had always existed in Viking times. We don't have to naturally say this was something new, but let's say that it, it's between the, the 11th and 13th century that this kind of more feudal-like, um, also, mm, mm, e e let's say, equipment, or in generally, feudal warfare was being developed in Scandinavia as well. So uh, the importance of mounted cavalry and especially of heavy cavalry um, began obviously to increase in this time, whereas previously um, it w had been the infantry normally to be you know, the, the, the main element. We can argue that actually in, in Scandinavia Feudal cavalry was not so hegemonic on the battlefields than in other areas of Europe at this time. Mm. 
I mean, we arrived up to the 13th century now. In the 13th century, um, feudal cavalry in, in, in Europe was the the hegemonic uh, force on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. In the outskirts of Europe, instead, if you take the Celtic range, also in here, Scandinavia, they realized that infantry had still kind of greater importance. Um, given also the terrain, given the fact, especially, however, it was mostly a political and social problem. It's because in these northern lands, feudalism had been more asphyctic, uh, had developed with less intensity, with uh, uh, with less uh, impact on, on the uh, in, in the society, mm -hmm. uh, with less incisiveness. There were lands, like for instance in Finland, that uh, these lands were also too mm, too poor to provide such large bodies of cavalrymen, etc. And where also the the local communities had remained largely autonomous at the point of there was no major massive threat uh, among uh, also in the area so um, more or less they kept organizing themselves in a more traditional way with the slavy of freemen were usually uh, on fighting on foot mm -hmm. and cavalry definitely existing but being probably less heavy on average or at least um, um, than, than the uh, continental one um, and or probably because this is also the the point, simply less in number. Mm -hmm. So obviously a Scandinavian feudal knight at this time was virtually identical to every single European knight. There is no essential difference into this. It's just that such type of warrior was probably still surrounded by other. Um, fires that in larger numbers that kind of also contained his preeminence on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Think of also really the terrain. Think of how countries I don't know like Sweden or uh, it could really be at this time. Extremely, still extremely wild in many ways. So it's not uh, cavalry developed also uh, in in parallel with the expansion of really the the, the transformation of the landscape. If you take Central Europe, etc. Uh, cavalry is best suited for heavy cavalry, at least for this massive pitched, I mean massive, let's say, battles in open ground, where there is space of maneuver, etc. Certain terrains, are, especially if they're wooded, there are swamps, rivers, lakes. Um, sp think especially about Sweden, but also think about Norway, with all these um, mountains and, and um, very few plains. It's difficult to use cavalry in there, and and that's arguably why. However, the also the Leidang as a system uh, was so um, long living because still the uh, maritime activity was sometimes more profitable. Mm -hmm. At this time, the the Scandinavians participate to the Crusades still through the essentially uh, these naval expeditions into the Mediterranean that were uh, f essentially put up through the Leidang. So, it, it's as if there, there was a continuity of, of the Viking era also through this time. It doesn't make sense to, to put a moment in which this, this finished. The, the, the Northmen kept being good uh, sailors, good um, uh, naval uh, combatants, and, and so on. So, the unit, as we've seen, w uh, of Rexman was this man, his equipment. We see also the crossbow that kicks in. The uh, the um, and the the provisions issued by the Leidang was usually um, meant to uh, last. Uh, the provisions for this meant to last for sixteen weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so also in here a lot of theoretical data in the sense that these sixteen weeks, which equate naturally to four months, are to be meant sometimes not as ac the actual provisions, but maybe, I don't know, just the equivalent of it. There was already probably a sort of more central administration that provided for some other uh, logistical needs. So it's always been like that. There's never been a moment in history in which ideally every single freeman arrived 
uh, with his uh, sack of provision on, on his shoulders and did everything by himself. There, w there is necessarily in these major um, uh, logistical enterprises a degree of centralization to which there is something that is put in common and um, it's better to organize that from, from the top than letting the single individuals taking care. There is much less um, dispersion of energies, much less attrition and it would be interesting also to, kn to know a bit more about this. Definitely these were extremely well organized expeditions where as we've seen the Northmen had got extremely specialized into this. They had a huge practice, a huge experience, they knew what they do and it was pro arguably so uh, normal <laughs> by certain standards to participate to such expeditions that everybody more or less knew what the the deal was without even needing to be um, trained for it. Um, the so as frequent as these expeditions were, th they were still you know um, something exceptional in conceptually speaking. Um, every man was sometimes it was really a problem of uh, availability of, of resources at a local base. Every single man tended to um, to serve um, on a rota basis every three years, uh, usually, uh, at least under normal circumstances. Then naturally this could vary a lot. There were pro surely years in wh to which I don't know more years into which someone didn't serve. There were other years into which these expeditions were kind of continued, and they they went on even into the uh, let's say for way more months than just four. Uh, also in here, however, consider the environmental conditions in, in north of Europe. Everything was preferably done during the good season uh, for self-evident uh, reasons. Um, the, uh, the This was concerning the men. The point was also providing the ships that is arguably also probably the most important thing. Because kind of, we have to imagine this society, especially when it was getting more stratified, to be also populated by people who had, of freemen that had maybe impoverished, they had lost their land, and that began to make this uh, um, living out of piracy and participating a bit just like sort of proletarians to these uh, things and going to fuel the uh, uh, the the herd of the local um, aristocracy, so simply going out there, searching for fortune, for fame, for glory, some of the greatest um, Viking commanders and also arguably founders of, of kingdoms started from relative nothing nothingness. This this is an uh, interesting characteristic of the Northman society that, you know, a, a successful uh, adventurer could, you know, if he was lucky enough, could really, uh, and, and, and skilled enough, could put up a lot of uh, a lot of loot and when coming home this loot would attract to him so many um, clients that he could fo form his own retinue and to um, and to start new expeditions and to grow in size. This is basically the in a nutshell how uh, the uh, Viking history r really went. Mm. Uh, it there is always in in war um, a, um, a sort of um, entrepreneurial character. Mm -hmm. War is always a business, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean it's done just by evil people who want to make money. This is not the, the story in itself. Things are extremely more complicated. Um, but just for saying that there was a motivation, a reason for all these expeditions to be mounted up so regularly. Mm -hmm. And this went refining all the organization and kind of orienting the society towards that direction. Um, so the ships were provided by a certain uh, number of afne combined. Now the afne would be the um, haven, uh, the hafen, the the harbor essentially. That literally it means I think shelter and something like that. Because uh, especially in this, uh, I don't know if you take the Western Scandinavia, that all these fjords etc the 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 bay the harbor is really this safe port uh, enclosed by the uh the uh, the the terrain from this uh, extremely impetuous and 
and tormented sea um, and the obviously especially that that is evident in especially in countries like Norway from from, from a geographical point of view the this structuration usually took um, shape on the base of these uh, fjords mm. uh, or generally speaking naturally it was a bit more complex there were several circumscriptions also in here there was a hierarchy so there was a major district than other subdivisions but definitely this system had started from the single base from this uh, I mean the, 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 the average unit what is the single village of uh, of uh, of fishermen or pirates or how you want to call them that had the individual uh, inf logistical infrastructures to, to build the ships to, to put an, them at, at sea and to launch expeditions from uh, from there um, the this um, these ships were probably meant to be already crewed uh, from the uh, Leiden. And, and interest, very interestingly, these uh, ships were all of a predetermined uh, regulatory uh, regular size. Mm. Uh, this uh, this size was measured into benches of oars. Uh, so either it could be of 13, 16, 20, 25, 30 benches. Mm. Uh, this is at least what we, we get from by the, by the uh, 12th century. And, and so these ships could probably, at lar uh, the largest ships could carry a mm, probably a maximum of 250, 260 men. Mm. The smallest ones around 90. Depends really. Uh, naturally, these ships were not. I mean, there was a certain degree of standardization given that the practice had brought, in fact, to see this um, different uh, the the subdivision into these various sizes based on the benches. But naturally, every ship was kind of built on its own. Uh, at this time, so naturally there is no standard crew, but generally speaking, these were the numbers. So, so a couple of, mm, you know, some 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 hundred men. Um, and interestingly enough, these ships were um, at least some of them were uh, built in order to launch and to carry uh, horses. They had stables within them. Um, we know this, for instance, from the ships that were used in the uh, Danish attacks on on the island of Rügen in the 60s of the 12th century well there was normally four uh, horses uh, in addition uh, for each ship to the normal um, to the to the normal um, complement let's say um, the, uh, the 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 um, the Danes the, the Danish as you want to call them were uh, this time expanding Pretty much towards, uh, especially the um, in um, into the Baltic Sea. The uh, in the sixties, uh, the there were these several um, uh, raids uh, from from Denmark onto uh, Rügen. Um, the first one, I think, started in, in, was in the fall of. Um, um, there were actually ha there had been other mm, raids in in on, on Rügen uh, in the since very early in time. Um, the I've been on Rügen, by the way. It's a beautiful place. Um, just thinking these things happening there is pretty magic. In the in the 11th century, this, that had happened. In the forties, in the eighties, um, in the in the same twelfth century, even before the sixties, there had been uh, raids in Arcona uh, in Arcona in eleven thirty six, always on Rügen. Then, from the fall of eleven fifty nine, we have this series of raids. In fact, the fall of um, eleven fifty nine on Rügen, always in Arcona. Then, in the fall of eleven sixty four. Um, the, da uh, the Danish devastated the, the the coastline on the island in April and May 1165. 
the Danish hit um, uh, Arcona Sudar and Guards um, and um, and also other raids because the, the Danish from there hit Pomerania I'm telling you the truth pretty pretty intensely um, in the fall of uh, 1165 another raid always in Arcona and, and also in uh, Yasmund and uh, Mön Mönchgut um, and in June 1168 another raid that um, basically um, brought Rügen under the the uh, Danish uh, dominate uh, dominion. Uh, Arcona was finally defeated, um, and the island became a Danish principality. At this point, uh, by the way, this was this occurred under uh, the uh, the Danish king Valdemar the first. And at this point, Valdemar um, also um, uh, pledges allegiance to um, Frederick the First Barbarossa, Holy Roman Emperor. Um, to uh, this was a way essentially to be accepted as ruler of of Rügen, and from this base um, and and the um, let's say the the allowance of of the Barbarossa, he began to launch. Um, uh, campaigns into Pomerania as as much. So the the Germans at this point were kind of also using. You know that there were also the 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 northern cru uh, during the northern crusades the the uh, the Danish had this mm, important expansion into the Baltic Sea uh, and the creation of several colonies in there. Uh, maybe we will we'll talk about it in in more in more uh, detail. Um, the there were there was also other mil military activity on Rügen. What is interesting about the the uh, horses that were issued for the ships in these raids is definitely that uh, the um, there was an extended uh, say raiding need to for which horses were definitely quite useful to do. Uh, Rügen is a sort of flatland. Uh, if you go there, you see that so. Having this sort of cavalry is um, very, very um, important. Of course, in Rügen there are certain many reliefs. There are some beautiful cliffs, famously also from romantic painting and, <laughs> and literature. But um, say that's definitely a terrain where you wanna use cavalry, and also for the raids in, onto the uh, into the mainland, there are pretty large spaces to raid uh, and so on. By the way, I advise you to, to make a vacation in on Rügen. If you want to go through Stralsund, just station there. There is a beautiful bridge that brings you into Rügen straight. You can tour that. It's full of tourists, not really nice in this sense, but uh, there is not an excessive much to see, to be honest, because I went there with a lot of expectation. But, but, but uh, definitely if you want to be immersed into nature and to, to to look at this beautiful landscape and always windy as <laughs> a given that this beautiful sea etc there are beautiful landscapes beautiful lights uh, and so on it might be fantastic it was there in, in summer if I'm not wrong um, but definitely also during the other parts of the year it must be very fascinating um, and thinking such um, you know events took place on there it's definitely very very fascinating Rügen is also the uh, the setting into the uh, you know many peoples actually came from back in in the day during in the ancient age from Scandinavia onto the continent passing through Rügen hmm. Rügen uh, should take also name from the Rugi or Rugi population. It's allegedly where the Longobards landed when they came from Scandinavia uh, and they clashed against the Vandals, interestingly enough, so very meaningful uh, place. Um, this thing of the horses is particularly important because you definitely f find um, ships that could lodge horses also during the Viking Age. And people, I don't know why, there were so many people who think that the Vikings had a, sh um, 
a weak cavalry or something like that. Um, many people are so tricked also by the idea that the Anglo-Saxons didn't use cavalry just because Geraldus Cambrensis said that it was not in their customs and tradition, but I'm personally quite skeptical, skeptical about it. I think cavalry was uh, used prominently and the fact that infantry was still stronger in these countries for which often cavalry is mounted to, to fight on foot also for certain cultural reasons but that, that is still functional to the political and social relations um, um, balance let's say but doesn't mean that these peoples didn't know how to fight on horseback on, on the contrary mm. uh, especially you know now, I, I don't want to digress, but uh, let's say that if you look at also the major Viking battles back in the day, there is often a lot, a freaking lot of cavalry. So, indeed, it was not the heavy feudal cavalry that will develop now in this period, but it was still a pretty strong one, and it, that's also obvious given the, the nature of the Viking raids, you know, this need of being, of moving fast and not to waste time to, to raid, um, extensively also riding on horseback and so on um, to make this kind of blitzkrieg and the Vikings were extremely well organized and I still haven't seen a single um, movie or fiction or something that that, that 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 really stresses the organizational abilities of these populations. I think personally the TV show Vikings sucks from an historical point of view. I mean, I mean it can be definitely interesting from from an artistical point of view which is definitely the most important thing but i i really w wonder how you know we want to stress this kind of macho like thing of the vikings while the greatest ach achievements of these populations like in, a, in any other civilizations were really things like the the organizational the logistical uh, point of view people are obsessed with the warrior ideals, they don't see what these guys were actually doing, which was pretty amazing in terms of sheer organizational skills, and we should stress that uh, a bit more, in, in my opinion. And this is where we get to the point, I guess, because uh, if you look at the potential the Leidang, or the Leidang, say better, um, the numbers have uh, are really impressive. So during these um, 12th, 13th century, let's give a look at the numbers a bit of what the single north, northern countries could field, or better to put into water <laughs> um, through the Leiden. So Norway in 1124 could rise allegedly 360 ships alone. Hmm? Very big number. Denmark 720 by 1137. Um, the um, during the 12th century Denmark is expanding so these um, numbers actually even increase um, they arrive up to an un a 860 ships in uh, a total of 30, 36,000 men mm -hmm. even before the, th the 13th century um, and at this point the, the maximum that Denmark could feel, at least on paper, was something like 1,400 ships and 160,000 men. Obviously, nobody could ever mobilize, not even a a, a fraction of that, um, say, a consistent fraction of that, because uh, we, we have no evidence of this. And these are numbers that come from, essentially, the, the pure ideal. E every feudal um, kingdom at this point started producing um, such um, say sources relative to the to the uh, amount of um, of manpower that could be fielded theoretically by all the um, kingdoms circumscription and surely these men could be there as a fighting force theoretically the problem was to to mobilize them and nobody could mobilize 160,000 men in 12th century Denmark, definitely. Uh, these men included, by the way, 1400 knights and as many crossbowmen as well. So in here you see also the rise of this mounted um, elite of the fuel and knights and the introduction of crossbow, like just in other uh, areas of Europe, or better, the revival of crossbows, because um, I'm personally very convinced that um, 
crossbows had always existed, even in early medieval times, and even if they were less powerful and definitely less widespread, but you know, crossbows are documented since the ancient world into into the continent, so it doesn't you have to give me a good reason for for this thing to have disappeared, at least in concept. So but obviously at this time crossbows were developing also dramatically in um, in um, in power in size and in number all over Europe so the northern countries were just uh, on the wake of this as well um, uh, the point I was going to make was um, yeah I mean that you find in any other kingdom these numbers that are theoretically extremely high you know if you go look I don't know the, the, the theoretical numbers that could uh, of the army that could be fielded by the kingdoms of England or, or France or, or Sicily you, you find it's huge numbers as well, but naturally no uh, army at that time could reach such, I mean, more than I would say even a s s mm, because even tens of thousands coming only from the levies of, of, of the kingdom, either feudal or tribal, wh wh whatever you want to call them um, probably didn't go even didn't reach up to even the, the tens of the thousands. Uh, it was much um, easier at this point to kind of move in to mobilize armies into concert with more or less the local elites that surely could field part of these troops but now we're kind of privileging the, the professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also an evident problem because if you raise so many levies who's gonna work the land at home? You're gonna cause a you know, economical collapse that you, you still need people working land, uh, you know, free, you know, able bodied men to provide the labor force for the economy to go. And just think that such expeditions, even fielding a single night, was a huge expense. So you, you necessarily needed someone who fed that night his horse, his retinues that produced the, the armor, which was extremely expensive, and so on. So you couldn't really neither dream of, of mobilizing all these troops at once. And indeed, I think at this point there was a lot of... Also, p I'm not really aware in the two Northern Europe how military professionalism was really was really there. I mean, how many mercenaries you could, could find, probably less than in other areas of Europe, but still I think they were developing also dramatically in proportion in these lands as just as in the rest of the continent. So war was getting a bit more um was always remaining in the range of business, but it was now the business of just of an elite, not like in previous times where more or less the whole society was committed to this massive effort. And you see it and we see it later also uh, as we were saying before uh in how the Leiden system evolved. So the people stopped actually participating to that in person, and they just began to pay taxes to to, to the pay it uh, as a tax to the uh, local to the central power. Um, there were um, so we have seen that Leidang was also um, 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 gradated. Mm -hmm. So. Mm, the there was a limit to the uh, also to the amount of uh, of people that could be sent in, in a single time. The, the Leidang was not meant to put in motion the whole society all at once. It was just a fraction of that, usually one third. In in the in normal circumstances, however, like in all uh, at all times, um, there were times um, there were moments of emergency. Hmm? in this um, historical context um, and the actually these wall numbers that we've seen before of, th of the total of the eligible population were theoretically m m to be put in motion through the so-called full Leidang or Utfarar uh, Leidang hmm? as it was called that was this kind of national levy mm, of, of the country and that had to make theoretically everyone participate. 
this, just like in other country, was like a desperate shout from the local um, um, authorities in case of, I don't know, national threat, you know, like an invasion, large scale, stuff like that, to say, okay, let's really bring in as many people as possible. Naturally, as we were saying before, only a, a fraction of these um, eligible population was actually went uh, was actually uh, used uh, and went to serve. Also, because there are, let's leave aside the. I mean, we can't leave it really aside, but it's not just a matter of resources that are not available to feed all these people. But it's also a matter of how to organize them. I mean, sometimes it's better to have a smaller army, uh, but with more resources and to make it work properly than having huge bodies of, of people that are like a rabble, a, a mass of, you know, a totally unorganized mass. Mm -hmm. And uh, and war is usually made through these kind of more contained numbers because there is there are certain principles of war to be maintained chiefly simplicity mm, so that everything uh, gets easier in organizational terms also in sheer uh, I mean also in simple matters of command how to um, move these people and and definitely the more resources you have and the less people you have and the more these people are gonna be effective because they're better fed they're better equipped so that's what you're looking for usually um and we've seen there was a total of 1400 ships in 13th century Denmark that could be put at sea but the even in these uh, dramatic situations um the largest danish fleets never exceeded say 200 300 ships let's say so that's um That's very realistic. Um, the mm, there was also another type of distinction uh, based on the nature of the uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. Offensive campaigns were usually fielding more uh, resources, obviously, as the attack is definitely more um, expensive than the defense. So usually th there was a so-called half lighting that was uh, issued, so theoretically um, not usually the usual one third of the uh, eligible uh, men, but a half. I believe this is the, the interpretation. Um, otherwise the one third would, would normally serve in, in defensive operations or for other campaigns that this really depended there was nothing standard uh, I can't stress this enough everything varied at all times there's never been a single expedition that was alike the other uh, and uh, no no army that was ever the same in any time in history so everything depended on the local um, organization that could really vary enormously just only for political reasons. Um, in the early uh, 13th century, um, Norway could f um, could um, put up an expedition of 309 ships and 14,000 men. Um, the which probably represents the normal, at least uh, at least a master, an annual uh, the, the annual master theoretically, because this was uh, a large expedition. Sometimes these expeditions were organized kind of um, repeatedly, not because they were issued, but just because it was common practice to do it. Because there was always some good reason for which launching an expedition every year. This is very important as well. It's something you can you find also in other words like the Carolingian one, that it was an exception to have one year to which there was no form of expedition ever. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the local authorities would try to master these um, these uh, men and ships just to see 
how how many were available at that point that was also a very important political test hmm, to see how many communities would join a certain um, enterprise and so on um, and at this same time in the early 13th century um, the in fact the maximum the, the full uh, Leidang was um, 40,000 men hmm. there was only the full Leidang um, in at this point um, we have to think also the the Viking era had come essentially to an end so however the um, the this um, maritime mindset of, of the Scandinavians hadn't stopped and in 1295 we have the events of 100 Norwe Norwegian sh uh, Norwegian ships hired out to the French by uh, uh, King Eric the uh, the second of Norway mm -hmm. uh, essentially France at this time was hammering uh, hard England it was in a pretty serious mess so Philip the second uh, excuse me Philip the fourth uh, king of France paid 15 uh, 50 thousand 50 thousand pounds to Norway for providing these 100 ships to to harass essentially the the English coasts, and in the meanwhile, you know, Britain was a pretty you know pretty mess, as there were rebellions in in Wales, um, um, sit bad situation to Scotland as well, and uh, France was trying to 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 press hard on, on this point by really joining, uh, making join everyone. Um, I think we don't know extremely more about this expedition in 1295 however it's still interesting because you see that the Scandinavians were still interacting with uh, the European continent uh, through their uh, naval power mm -hmm. that was intervening also in other um, you know, in foreign uh, matters like like this one. Um, so, this is the point. The Leidang was really conceived as mostly as a uh, as a naval service. This was the 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 concept in origin, mm -hmm. and it it was in unavoidably destined to decline as a as a form of recruitment and military organization throughout the time especially um, given the international situation was definitely changing as now the uh, European monarchies were the continental monarchies uh, the one of Britain etc were strengthening so they had a better uh, recruitment system on their own that they, they were relatively stable they could fill enough men to, and, and Scandinavian distance was kind of lagging behind, so they they had no chance basically to hold this. I, I mean to 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 do something about this. After all, we normally conceive 1066 as the end of the Viking Age, ideally as uh, the great. Uh, Commander, uh, the great Norwegian king Harald Rada was defeated and killed in battle into by the Anglo-Saxons uh, into England. So it's a bit the end of an age, and that was the let's say the the, the proof, if you want, that time was were basically ending. Um, surely um, the um history ha might have ter taken another uh turn especially um um I on that occasion i mean 1066 is naturally at this crucial time um just think if what what would have happened if the uh, i don't know if the battle of stamford bridge in fact had been won by the uh by the norwegians um at that point probably the the normans would have still 
managed to seize um, England, but um, uh, the, the same could go just if Hastings had been won by the Anglo-Saxons at that point. If, if, if Hastings had been won by the Anglo-Saxons, it's very likely that England would have uh, maintain a much stronger norm, uh, I mean, um, n let's say Northman influence, uh, Northern influence then, it would have not been um, Francisized by the Norman invasion. Uh, also probably the military organization would have evolved, probably not in s very different ways to the, uh, to the to the feudal one eventually because just like the Scandinavians kind of adopted eventually feudalism on the Western Frankish model so would England even if it had not been conquered by the Normans but definitely probably the same defeat of Hastings um, shows that that Anglo-Danish form of organization was kind of not necessarily declining, it was not functional, because I think that the Anglo-Saxon fear was actually pretty impressive. It was the, the Anglo-Saxons had a very advanced admi administration that also concerned the military affairs, and in fact the Normans were quite clever to definitely export feu import feudalism into England, but also to keep alive certain local administrative forms of the organization, the, the, all the districts and so on, because that was highly functional, and that's what why England, by the time uh, was uh, kept being such a modern uh, monarchy, uh, um, but indeed, if you look at what Frankish feudalism is, it was really expanding all over Europe. Mm -hmm. The Scandinavians weren't conquered by any f Frankish or Francicized power like the Normans, but they still adopted, albeit very slowly, but they still adopted. They still went towards that direction. The um, the feudal system, and probably even if the Anglo-Saxons had won at Hastings, they would have still done something similar over time. It's a bit of, of a normal story. There is a moment into which society is more egalitarian, then something changes, there is a crisis, uh, it can be a political or military crisis, it can be a socio-economical crisis, and society stratifies. And therefore, at the the uh, the elites arrive to the top, and in this sense, in a medieval perspective, that the elite equated to a decline of the freeman class and the rise of mounted combat of this professional military elite it was extremely um, uh, um, aristocratic in mindset, and that, wor that that was therefore very, very different from the um, from the freeman model that, that wa we have seen uh, being at the origin of these uh, Germanic um, societies. So, uh, what else can we add now? The oh well, we we have to talk of how in fact the Leidung evolved uh, also in uh, during the 12th and 13th century because this is the moment in which it began its uh, its decline. Mm -hmm. um, the we can um, as we have just said there were certain social uh, political and social transformations that occurred for which probably there was an impoverishment also the same freemen into Scandinavia etc so at this point the the participation of the communities came to to a not really to an end because obviously there was always a local levy something like that and as we've said before, uh, these northern communities maintain a greater ethos place on the traditional infantry and the local militias, etc. But feudalism tends to disarm the communities. Mm. It always happens. Um, whoever gets at the top doesn't like the people to be armed mm. if he wants to rule with an iron fist. So progressively, this doesn't happen really directly. It happens through really the, the impoverishment of the population, through wars, through um, this continuous um, exertions of, uh, you know, and um, and a force that progressively wear out the, say, the sap of the 
uh, middle classes that are not able to 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 field to 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 let's say to provide enough resources to uh, keep up with the increase increasing professionalization of warfare mm -hmm. um, so during the 12th century the lay trans begins to transform into something more like a tax not like a military service proper mm -hmm. so that the the usual men that have to go fighting into this levy doesn't even mm, go anymore uh, especially with the so-called board uh, Leidang mm -hmm. which means um, that only the provisions had to be provided and not the fighter anymore so this in practice just means that the local lord the local king whatever takes just mm, exacts a, a certain payment it can be either in cash or in provisions uh, or both actually um, which is considered as the equivalent of the um, of the military service mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how this also probably increased um, in terms of sheer number of provisions because if you basically take away the the man you th there was probably also an increase in the amount of material that was requested in, in exchange mm -hmm. um, and this this is what we were saying before is it's essentially the the idea that warfare begins to be organized increasingly from the top so uh, feudalism brings this uh, stratification of the so society the strengthening of the elites and these elites just they're they're more about war than the freemen's are now so they know how to organize warfare they do it from the top they just request to the local communities this amount of uh, cash and or provisions and no military service even not always though because this as, as we saying before never disappeared actually theoretically everyone could every fr um, able-bodied freeman could could be sent to war theoretically but this this becomes to be a, an increasingly rarer evenience in these monarchies basically just make draw all these resources and organize warfare on their own mm -hmm. so paying their military retinues which by the way at this time were um, essentially transformed from the herdsmen you know that today we didn't talk about the herd um, but let's say the since Viking times there were these uh, royal and noble retinues in the Scandinavian world that were kind of of professionals like in the rest of Europe like if you take the familia or the masnata I mean they were simp simply the retinues of the local lords or kings mm. so they were professionals that basically followed they were all about war they followed and they, they made up the bodyguards of the nobility and so on and they were truly professionals they were knights essentially um, and they were privileged over the rest of the population so what happened in the uh, northern world was si practically the same already before we said how always in the northern world in spite of this um, egalitarian edus there had always been an oligarchy that ruled and this oligarchy was a warrior or oligarchy that essentially of chieftains that had a military retinue into war uh, uh, and that mm, paid these retinues through loot, essentially. This is something that we we get from Tacitus since you know the time of the ancient Germans. It's the comitatus, mm, the idea that um, there are no, there is not just the sippe, so the village with the guys who work in the land and they organize them by themselves. This kind of militias. There are essentially certain nuclei of um, professional warriors that wander around and just uh, raid and pillage and and the progressive stratification of these societies had occurred through this process so always through war through the idea that there was a leader that paid his um, retinues uh, by sharing the loot together with them 
So these were privileged people, naturally. They lived in, in the uh, Lord's household, and they followed him in, into battle, into war, etc. So um, this already existed since the Viking Age, and, and even before, naturally. And at this time, between the 11th and 13th century that we have seen today, these retinues um, kind of get transformed to get uh, diversified. We will have to talk it about it in a in a dedicated video, but progressively they transform substantially into a feudal class of knights, essentially, mm -hmm. because the monarchy strengthens itself, and therefore these guys are not just simple followers to join to Viking rights their leaders. They become landed aristocracy that has to provide for, uh, I don't know, uh, m m heavy cavalry for the uh, for for the king and stuff like that. So this is how it basically took shape. Although this is all, all very shaded, as you can imagine, and there were vast areas of the north that still remained very untouched also by this um, feudal transformation simply because the environment didn't allow that. There were communities that kept living very autonomously, very freely, very relatively untouched. And uh, This is a kind of interesting character of Scandinavian armies during the Middle Ages, because from, from one side you see the, the feudal cavalry, this uh, heavily armored mounted elite, and next to that um, still certain communities of, of of freemen, like of hunters, of woodmen, of fishermen, that they kind of still were pretty warlike, they were pretty tough, they were pretty skilled, because they lived out there in the wild, they they were pretty... Uh, they had a quite intense military average for being just militia. Mm -hmm. Obviously they were still militia, so it's not that they were professional warriors, in fact, and not that... But there was still this reserve that in other countries in Europe you don't really find. This is not something you find, I don't know, into France or into Italy. You, unless, yeah, you don't go really into the mountains where also in there, in fact, there were more warlike communities that kind of start doing what the same thing that Vikings had done in the past during the... Uh, I mean, it, there were certain valley communities that um, couldn't sustain all the population when there was an increase um, in a, a demographic increase, so these mercenaries from regions like uh, the Apennines or uh, the, uh, sent out there, f set out from there and started to, to, be, to become mercenaries were not sheer brigands or stuff like that. But let's say this process is way more marked uh, in, in Scandinavia still. Because the, the, that environment was transformed much more slowly. And, in, and simply in certain areas it was not possible to carry that out mm. because feudalism just remember this goes in necessary parallel with the transformation also of the landscape of the land exploitation of deforestation of reclamation of bonification whatever you want to call it um, which allows that feudal system to to be sustained from a sheer energetical point of view. Well, there are re certain regions of the world where you can't do that. And that's why feudalism developed only in certain areas of the world, while certain areas remained kind of more tribal in nature. Um, so, okay, perhaps we stop here today. Um, I just wanted to stress, which I didn't do it very much, you know, the, the, the impressive... Um, amount of ships that these single northern countries could, could really put at sea. Um, and today we unavoidably talked um, also about the Viking Age, as probably also Scandinavian society hadn't changed in these following centuries enormously much from before. But I will be more precise also in the late uh in uh, in other videos I will specifically dedicate to the Vikings. This is meant to be kind of feudal Scandinavia, or early feudal Scandinavia, let's say better. And that's it. And I don't know when I will do it, because as I often say, I choose my daily 
topics quite randomly, so I don't know when I will be talking about the Vikings or or Scandinavian history in general uh, soon, however. So, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.